we are very honored and happy to welcome Mr. Nuri Turkel here at the U.S. Embassy today to talk about his mission and work as human rights advocate for China. Mr. Turkel is an attorney by profession. He's a human rights advocate, and he's also an author. He's also chair of the United States Commission for International Religious Freedom. He serves as chairman of the board for the Uyghur, for the Uyghur Human Rights Project, which he co-founded in 2003. He works as a senior fellow for, the, fellow for the Washington think tank, the Hudson Institute, where he focuses on U.S. foreign policy and national security issues. Mr. Turkel, welcome to the embassy. Thank you so much for having me. So before we dive into the conversation, I wanted to ask you if you could briefly talk about yourself, um, your personal background, um, and also for our German audience um, here to briefly explain who the Uyghurs are um, which will be the main focus of our conversation today. Thank you very much. I have uh, different identities. Uh, you know, I'm an immigrant uh, lawyer, as you mentioned, um, human rights advocate, and now U.S. official. But uh, for me now, the most important identity is my Uyghur background, Uyghur uh, ethnicity, uh, because of the fact that the China has been waging genocide, committing acts of genocide, crimes against humanity, as recognized by our government and several other liberal democracies around the world. Uh, the point is that I was born in a re-education camp uh, during the height of the Cultural Revolution. Um, my mom, my mother, was uh, her third trimester mm -hmm. when she was taken to the camp uh, where she was subject to verbal and physical abuses and ended up injuring herself. Uh, she delivered me while physically injured, um, specifically while she was in, in cast chest down. Uh, after I was born, uh, my mother and I spent uh, several months uh, uh, until up until early spring 1971, and we got released. While all this was happening, my father was performing agricultural labor in a remote area that is about three hours away from my place of birth, Kashgar. Okay. Uh, as being educator, um, it was a university, university graduate, uh, recently graduated, and then uh, teaching at a local high school at the time. Um, that's my uh, background. Uh, that's how I arrived to this world. And I also never thought that I'd be talking about the way that I have been literally almost uh, every day, uh, and as much as I have been, to remind the world that uh, what is happening today is essentially the time period that I lived through on steroids. So. On World's Watch, uh, China is committing genocide against the Uyghur people. Um, the way that they're conducting this genocide is targeting Uyghur's ethno-national identity, uh, rounding up thought leaders, uh, uh, professors, uh, authors, stage performers, uh, even some instance uh, soccer players for traveling to places like Spain to get training uh, with famous soccer players that the international community uh, and know about. Um, the Uyghur people, the, why the Chinese decided to wage this uh, camp campaign to destroy Uyghur's ethno-national identity because the Uyghurs are different from the majority Han Chinese. The Uyghurs are Turkic people based on China's government's own estimate. Um, there are about 12 million Uyghurs living within China. Uh, the Uyghurs' homeland uh, traditionally historically known as East Turkestan that is referred to as Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, uh, that is the official name, makes one-sixth of the China proper. It's a huge landmass. Uh, it provides easy access to Eurasian natural resources and marketplace, and also has a long international border. Um, just to give a perspective, um, uh, give an idea to, to the audience about the size of, it's about the size of Western Europe. Uh, four times the size of California. It's a huge, it's, huge. it's a rich, um, mm -hmm. uh, it has a massive uh, oil and natural gas reserve. Mm -hmm. It is one of the largest agricultural base, uh, bases in China. And now we find out that um, because of uh, region's cotton production, the international brand's been using Uyghur slave labor to make uh, baby pajamas on the shirt cotton shirts that we all enjoy as a global consumers. So the, to the Chinese, uh, the Uyghur's homeland has been always been very precious. 
they had taken ownership already. That was not enough. They controlled the Uyghur lives. Mm -hmm. That didn't seem to be enough, and now they're trying to just destroy it. So essentially, um, the, you know, it's not a Holocaust, mm -hmm. but a similar type of uh, atrocities have been committed. When you look at the language, even the way that they formulated policies, uh, German audience know about the Vensi Conference, mm -hmm. where half of the uh, individuals helped Adolf Eichmann to decide the fate of the Jewish people. The Vensi Conference. Yes, yeah. uh, happened to be somebody, uh, happened to be individuals who, who had PhDs. Mm -hmm. In a similar way, the Chinese initially relied on the Chinese intellectuals, mm -hmm. uh, individuals working in China's social uh, academy to write the blueprint mm -hmm. that get the attention of current Chinese supreme leader Xi Jinping. So this has been an ongoing repression with the different names as long as I can remember, but it got to the, the point of genocide uh, starting late 2016. So your advocacy is, of course, connected to your cultural identity, right? Absolutely. Also to your work um, in the Commission for International Religious Freedom. So how does that intersect? In, um, you know, I'm not a religious leader. I don't have a background in theology. Um, uh, as somebody who is trained in a legal profession, um, I am the first uh, U.S. educated Uyghur lawyer. Uh, and I, I feel always that um, the, the people, specifically ethno-religious groups, uh, should be left alone, mm -hmm. should be allowed to practice their religion. or, or not to practice any religion. So when I was asked to uh, uh, serve in this commission by former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, mm -hmm. what, it, what come across as very appealing is the fact that I'll be covering the religious freedom issues, the entire China. Mm -hmm. So the Chinese Communist Party, uh, any type of religion, specifically uh, uh, Western religion as they identify, Christianity mm -hmm. and Islam in particular, uh, always been seen as something disloyal to the party. Mm -hmm. And uh, these two religions in particular has been perceived as a potential so source of unrest uh, or reason for undermining Communist Party's rule. And, and uh, after looking at the Commission's work, I find this to be very appealing uh, work for me to be involved. Because when you look at it, as, as I uh, alluded earlier, China's initial intention is to destroy Uyghur's way of life, uh, Uyghur culture, Uyghur history, and most importantly, Uyghur religion. So I thought this is a, a perfect opportunity while we're having this uh, discussion on, in, in Washington how to respond to this atrocity crimes. And, and for I've, I find it compelling to, to join this commission, uh, serve in even my current role as the the head of this organization uh, agency to advance the cause, uh, advance the, the, the rights of those who have been persecuted because of their religion uh, in communist China, and also using uh, my, this platform to advocate for those who have not been hurt mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. For example, people um, uh, like Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, mm -hmm. the Yazidis who've been also subject to genocide. We have, um, as a global community, have a serious uh, problem with uh, not uh, taking a bold, coherent uh, actions to stop or hold those perpetrators to account. In the last 10 years or so, we have already seen three genocidal uh, actions, three genocides, one starting with the Yazidis, and then the Rohingyas and now the Uyghur Muslims. So I, I always ask myself, uh, why wouldn't we do more to stop this genocide so that we can prevent the next one? Because, you know, at the end of the day, the bad actors, the perpetrators, don't end up suffering the cause for their behavior. Uh, then we will see the repeated actions. Because of the international community's uh, meandering, tepid response, except for the United States government, this genocide is still underway. So making uh, this important promise, never again, uh, almost meaningless. Uh, during the Nuremberg trial, American prosecutor Robert Jackson said never again. And he meant something, and we should be reminded of, people have a bad impulses. 
if you don't remind them something that cannot happen, it cannot be tolerated, you end up seeing it all over again. Mm -hmm. So strangely, uh, history is repeating, but not it by itself. We're letting history to repeat. Mm -hmm. For that, I'm very, very regretful that I have to even go around the world and tell people that never again should mean something. And that's what you're doing also yes. here in Germany. Yes. So um, the United States, in particular this administration, has been at the forefront of fighting China's oppression of yeah. religious minorities, yeah. including the Uyghurs. Yeah. So what are some of the milestones that you have achieved or that the government has achieved, with your help, of course, um, to, to, to reach this goal? I'd like to um, point out something for your audience. Why the United States government cares so much about religious freedom? Religious freedom uh, for the American people, for our country, is very important. It's, it's considered as the first human rights. It is in our Declaration of Independence. This is a much older document than the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights was based on Bill of Rights. So everything essentially originated from the idea that people should be allowed to practice their religion, or not to practice any religion. So that's what we believe as Americans. Mm -hmm. So how do we use that? We use that to shine a spotlight that the Chinese Communist Party uh, has waged war on faith, as always repeated by former Ambassador Large for International Religious Freedom, Ambassador Sam Brownback. I wholeheartedly agree with that notion. So using that to educate people, and this is one of the ways in which we were able to build bipartisan coalition. American people genuinely care about religious freedom. And we're not in the business of promoting one religion over another. We're just promoting the idea that people should be left alone and let people to be who they are, practice their religion, or not to practice any religion. Uh, so what have we accomplished? Uh, with, based on that bipartisan consensus, the previous administration and current administration both have uh, recognized uh, the genocide, uh, officially recognized atrocities committed against the Uyghurs as a genocide and crimes against humanity. And then the other piece that was also equally important, we were able to advocate for the Rohingya Muslims that Secretary Blinken, through his speech at the Holocaust Museum, also recognized as a genocide, which is remarkable. Mm -hmm. In the previous U.S. administration, this was something contentious, uh, did not uh, uh, garner enough support. Mm -hmm. Using the Uyghur genocide determination as an example that when we take bold actions, when we do the right thing, not only history will be kind to us, but the sky does not fall on us. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of using that metaphor uh, to advocate for the Rohingya Muslims. That's an executive uh, branch's public statement. In addition to those steps, we were able to uh, work with the senior officials in the previous administration and the current administration. Uh, to advocate for targeted sanctions, uh, which has been also accomplished. Um, as bipartisan commission, uh, we are legislatively mandated to advise Congress, Secretary of State, and President, making sure that international religious freedom is an integral part of our foreign policy agenda. So we fold this, uh, these issues uh, in a broader foreign policy agenda to encourage uh, the executive branch to uh, entity list uh, the companies that have been impl uh, complicit in repression in Tibet, uh, repression in uh, Uyghur homeland, uh, Xinjiang as they call it, and also um, the um, uh, destructive efforts uh, upending the Hong Kong democracy. Uh, and it has been a very important uh, milestone as a result, and specifically in the Uyghur case, there are over, there have been over 110, uh, I believe, over 114 punitive sanctions have been announced. Mm -hmm. The entity list designation, sanctions under the Global Magnitsky Act, uh, visa restriction, which is remarkable. As somebody who is working in the human rights space for so long, I find it to be very, very inspiring, and to the extent. Uh, admirable that the previous administration and current administration essentially speaking the same language, taking a similar position, and the Biden administration have expended this, uh, this effort, bringing in our partners and allies in Europe to join the effort. As a result, in April 2021, EU, uh, United States, Canada, UK 
announced uh, 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 joint sanctions against the Chinese officials. This is also remarkable. And President Biden took the matter to G7, uh, G20, uh, EU summit, NATO summit. So this has become a much bigger um, uh, concerns and endeavor for the United States government. On con in Congress, uh, it is e equally uh, impressive progress that have been made. We passed laws on Hong Kong, uh, on Tibet, and in the Uyghur case, we have uh, two laws, uh, two pieces of legislation already been enacted. The first one is in June 2021, uh, 20, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, uh, spearheaded by uh, Speaker Pelosi. And then the second one is the Uyghur uh, Forced Labor Prevention Act, which is remarkable. I arguably that is the most important legislative uh, mandate that Congress put in place since China joined the WTO to address some of the lingering uh, issues in our trade relationship with Communist China. So those are the uh, things that which happened in a short period of time. The reason, I'm glad that you asked this, and the Europeans should have done the same thing. Because at the end of the day, this is a, a global problem. This is not a typical human rights problem that the international community either to ignore or passionately advocated for. It's a very unique circumstances. Therefore, it requires multilateral, bilateral, collective individual efforts. So during your visit here, you were speaking to German officials, to think tanks, and, and leading um, people yeah. from sciences and academia. Um, what is your, what, in your conversations, what was your message to them, or what are recommendations that you would give to Germany, for instance, to support or come up with similar bills as the one that you just mentioned on right. essentially modern slavery, right? Right, right. Um, four issues are very important for the German public, uh, German officials to consider um, uh, implementing. One is um, a recognition of the issue. Uh, looking the other way, pushing to the side, or wishful thinking of that matter to go away some point is a naivete. Uh, I don't think that, that that's what it is today. So German government um, must uh, recognize uh, the atrocities committed against Uyghurs as a genocide, as articulated uh, in the Genocide Convention. As you may know, there are about uh, more than 150 countries signatories to the Genocide Convention. Under the Article 1 of the Genocide Convention, state parties must call it out, uh, stop it, and punish. So only uh, nine, ten governments, in, uh, including U, uh, EU Parliament, and most recently, the Taiwanese Parliament, officially recognized atrocities as genocide. They give it a proper name. Everything should have a proper name. Germany should not be afraid to call it what it is. Mm -hmm. And Germany has a moral obligation. Frankly speaking, Germany should lead this effort, not us, mm -hmm. not UK, not Canada. Germany should lead this effort to stop this genocide and be leader in the efforts to stop and prevent next uh, genocide that are happening to vulnerable ethno-religious groups. So that's one strong message that I want German people to uh, hear me out. Mm -hmm. It's not that difficult. We did it. And, and it's, it, it has worked. And, and to the Chinese, it, it, uh, that's uh, some of the most important things Chinese care so much about how it's portrayed in public, uh, specifically public condemnation. Mm -hmm. Two, their economic interests. And three, now their technological uh, uh, competitiveness. Mm -hmm. So those are the three areas. Uh, and the first one, calling them out, mm -hmm. is very important. And that's the, how you get their attention. Taking a public stance. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Leadership. Yes. Okay. So this is not one of those instances that you just uh, dancing around or changing the t uh, language from atrocity crimes to mis, uh, like human rights abuses or mistreatment. You can mistreat somebody, mm -hmm. but that does not necessarily a genocide. You can commit human rights abuses, but mm -hmm. that's not necessarily acts of genocide, mm -hmm. or ethnic cleansing, or uh, war crimes, or crimes against humanity. So the German people should know uh, taking a soft stance or looking the other way or making general statement, as we have seen in Germany's relationship with Russia, we end up in a, uh, in a, a deliterist, uh, uh, it, it end up in a, in a very uh, undesirable way, uh, lack of a better word. 
And then the other thing is uh, uh, cleaning up a global supply chain of the slave produced, slave labor produced products. United States government has led the effort. Uh, we've been engaging with the uh, Canadian government, uh, engaging with the U European Parliament. But on a national level, we should also uh, have, we would like to see a legislative initiatives mm -hmm. to put pressure on the businesses. And Germany, again, historically, has, uh, has, a, has, a, has some negative um, track records, mm -hmm. namely Volkswagen, namely Hugo Boss, the same type of companies adding semen that helped to build China's, uh, um, reportedly built Chinese uh, surveillance uh, capabilities, and now doing the same thing. So we need to use um, Germany's history, and also Germany has really good uh, 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 showcase um, uh, instances that can tell the general public and politicians to convince them. As you know, during the Nuremberg trial, some of the German industrials stood in trial for their complicity in the crimes against Roma and Jewish people. Same thing can be done. And then finally, uh, Europe has much stricter uh, privacy laws, and, um, and German people, rightfully so, cares about their privacy. And now we have this uh, digital authoritarianism, tech surveillance. Some of the most sophisticated form of uh, surveillance have been developed, tested, and metastasizing around the world. More than 80 countries, as stated by Secretary Clinton, uh, excuse me, as stated, more than 80 countries, as stated by Secretary Blinken in his China speech, China policy speech, have imported, adopted, and utilizing Chinese tech surveillance. Which to me is, it should give a, a, a really, we should concern citizens of the free world. Chinese tech surveillance equipments come with a huge price. Uh, Huawei, for example, brags about having cloud storage contract with over 140 countries. That means that we are surrendering or personal data, family pictures, text messages, email communications, stored in the Chinese storage, data storage. And, and Europeans, it, it's puzzling, perplexing to me that Europeans with the culture of caring so much about privacy, not paying attention to the, the Chinese uh, tech incursion into their lives. When the United States call the Chinese tech firms out, based on a national security concern, people should not uh, take that lightly. Mm -hmm. It's a serious threat. Mm -hmm. When heads of uh, law enforcement, uh, specifically uh, the British and U.S. law enforcement, said that a certain tech firms, Chinese tech firms, is a national security uh, threat, that Europeans should take that to heart and act upon in a similar way. Uh, punishing uh, through sanctions of uh, individuals, companies, that developed uh, and tested and utilizing those uh, technology equipments should be held to account. Mm -hmm. uh, in the United States, we have, uh, uh, we have uh, learned in December 2021 that the Biden administration uh, entity listed a Chinese Medical Military Academy and its 11 affiliates for developing brain control weaponry. Mm -hmm. During the Nazi era, uh, Jewish lives were used for biomedical research. In the year 2022, a country, the People's Republic of China, that Germany has intimate economic diplomatic relationship with, already developed brain control weaponry. Mm -hmm. I'd like to have your uh, audience to let this sink in. Okay. So um, I want to make sure our audience understands the situation in Xinjiang, because I think from our perspective here, it's very difficult to to really fathom what is going on there. And so my question to you would be, could you talk a little bit about everyday life there? Do you, are you in touch with your family? Yeah. You mentioned um, that you were born in a camp. Yeah. There are still camps. Um, what do these camps look like? Do you even receive any information yeah. from there? One other point, mm -hmm. um, I, before I forgot, I'd like to mention transnational repression. Mm -hmm. So the, in, in the German society, uh, in any other European uh, communities, now we know that uh, more than 50 uh, satellite police stations have been set up. This was in the BBC, mm -hmm. people can look up. And we also came to know that 
in the, even in the United States, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and New York, similar type of police stations have been set up to monitor activists. So I mean, that's stations a stations outside of China. Yeah, that's a Chinese. The Chinese yes, government. they are bullying activists, mm -hmm. threatening, mm -hmm. and in some instances trying to um, uh, kidnap mm -hmm. and take them okay. to China. So that's a f huge sovereignty issue. If anyone cares about their country's sovereignty, need to pay attention to the transnational repression. And uh, to your question, uh, during the process of writing my book, uh, No Escape, I studied the history of concentration camps. Uh, and I interviewed a historian specialized in the history of concentration camp. The Chinese also studied that very well, based on what, what we know now. Starting 2016, late 2016, say they start building massive camp system. We're talking about um, some villages, township turning into open air prison. Uh, some old schools, uh, schools, high schools, uh, university campuses, uh, manufacturing sites uh, turn into makeshift prison camps because it was over uh, floating. Uh, so the Chinese managed to replicate the historical concentration camps to round up uh, individuals. Uh, the leaked documents published in New York Times in November 2019 uh, has quotes from directly from Xi Jinping and uh, then the party secretary, Chen Quanguo, who has been sanctioned by the United States government uh, under global Magnitsky sanction, said that everyone should be rounded up, should be rounded up. So there's no standard. I, in my book, I also profiled uh, individuals who were just uh, rounded up by the Chinese based on just ethnicity and religious background. Uh, in one instance in the summer of 2017, in 10 days, the algorithm, artificial intelligence, the massive data that Chinese built on the Uyghur people, ordered through a computer to uh, arrest 20,000 Uyghurs. Mm -hmm. This was in the leaked documents, the government, uh, um, that was published through Investigative uh, Journalism Consortium. They were not, the police could not find 20,000. They ended up finding 16,000. So under the pressure, they added another 1,000. Uh, so the, in, in 10 days alone, in summer 2017, in one township, they rounded up uh, 70,000, 17,000 people. With that, 17,000 people's lives are shattered. Men, children, women. Children. And, then, and no one knows if they committed any crime. Mm -hmm. Again, goes to the, the historical aspect of concentration camps. Mm -hmm. When you rounded up, um, I mean, this is very common. Uh, you round up individuals based on ethnic, religious background, mm -hmm. or your wealth or your influence on society. Once you end up in the camp, I mean, this is very similar to what happened to the Jewish people. Yeah. You don't know why you're there, uh, other than you being who you are. Mm -hmm. No one charged you with anything. No one tells you what kind of crime that you committed. You just sit there. And then the third is, no one knows when you will be out. Mm -hmm. And then finally, if you manage to be out, no apologies offered no compensation, no method to reintroduce you to the society. So those are the four commonalities with the camps that we know in China today with the one that we know in the history books. Mm -hmm. Very similar. So essentially the Chinese uh, borrowed the pages from the Hitler's playbook mm -hmm. when they're setting up this camp. As for the numbers, um, the Chinese published the white paper uh, a few years ago. In it, they mentioned uh, 1.3 million Uyghurs went through re-education program. Mm -hmm. uh, re-education program, that's how they call yeah, it. So it's, yeah. a, it's a euphemism that they use. Okay. It's a, it's a, it, that's is a softer uh, way mm -hmm. of describing. Re-educating what? The people educated already. We have individuals who are the mm -hmm. president of Xinjiang University, an uh, individual that at question has PhD from Japan, mm -hmm. uh, honorary doctor's degree from a university in France. Mm -hmm. Do you really need to educate individuals like him? Mm -hmm. Do you really need to educate somebody who is uh, working as a head of a major publishing house mm -hmm. owned by the state? So that's, uh, that's a euphemism that they use. So 1.3 million Uyghurs annually went through for that five, period, five years period. If you add them up, you can come up with a staggering number. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense 
Former Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Affairs, Randy Schreiber told media in summer 2019 that the U.S. government believes, or estimates, two to three million Uyghurs were in the camp. So I know Randy very well, mm -hmm. uh, and he's not a loose talker, and he's a senior government official, he was. And when people like Randy talk, people should also pay attention. Mm -hmm. So that's just a very conservative number. On top of those individuals who are in the camp, we have, as reported in the New York Times, 800,000 to 1 million Uyghur uh, children mm -hmm. have been forcibly removed from their families. Mm -hmm. This goes to the heart of the legal definition of genocide. And then finally, uh, including those women in the camp, as well as the women in their places of uh, residence, they've been subject to sexual violence, mm -hmm. uh, forced sterilization. Uh, rape, uh, one of those camp survivors, as I, as I profiled in the book, who lives in Washington today, told the graphic stories uh, uh, through an interview on BBC. You know, Uyghurs are generally very conservative. A Uyghur woman casually won't talk about that kind of experience, mm. yeah. which she did. Mm -hmm. And today, when you look around, most of the vocal uh, individuals mm -hmm. campaigning for the rights of those left behind in the camps or happen to be a Uyghur woman. So it's a gender-based violence issue Yes, as well. and then at their place of residence, under this uh, family program, mm -hmm. another euphemis euf euphemistic term, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. send Chinese cadres to the Uyghur homes mm -hmm. to sleep and eat with Uyghur ladies, mm -hmm. uninvited, mm -hmm. and committing sexual violence. Mm -hmm. In the Netherlands-based uh, former teacher told me uh, some of the graphic stories that she experienced. Mm -hmm at home while her husband is watching TV in the living room. Yeah. So, so those are the things. And also, uh, we talked about the slave labor. Um, and and uh, 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 a senior official at the State Department, Dan Nadell, uh, told media a couple of years ago that the United States government believes that the China has created an open-air prison-like environment for people who are not even in a camp. A place of worship, a uh, place of residence. Like people should be able to enjoy. They have QR codes put on the doors, so the government know who is in, who is out. Mm -hmm. Even in my family situation, I haven't been able to see my mother mm -hmm. since 2004. Anyone who has mother or know somebody who has mother can just appreciate how painful that is. Mm -hmm. For me as well as for my mother, who brought me to this world in such a horrific circumstances, cannot even. Uh, have a, a normal life. Since 1995 up until today, I had been only able to spend 11 months with my late father and my mother wow. since 1995. That gives you an idea uh, the cost mm -hmm. uh, of being an advocate. Personal and cost. Yes, mm -hmm. but yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fulfilling, gratifying mm -hmm. experience speaking out, uh, be a voice for uh, people who have no voice mm -hmm. or voiceless is empowering. Uh, I, could, I couldn't think of anything else that I've done differently. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, when you uh, in this kind of, uh, in this line of work, whether in the government service or in the advocacy work, you feel like that you have a historical assignment or task assigned mm -hmm. to you. That's how I feel. Mr. Turkel, thank you very much for sharing your um, insight and your knowledge with us. Um, I do want to ask you, though, if you have one final message. You mentioned what companies can do. You mentioned what go uh, government officials can do. What can individuals do here in Germany to support the Uyghur cause? The, the three messages uh, for the businesses, I wanted to uh, uh, sound the alarm that there is a legal risk, uh, there is a reputational risk, there's an investment risk and there's a consumer risk. Mm -hmm. So the business leaders um, should know that this is a time for them to do the some, something right. The history will be kind to those who does the right thing. Mm -hmm. uh, for politicians, I want politicians to be honest. They do know what is happening. Mm -hmm. They need to grow some backbone, be, be courageous. Uh, and I don't think that, you know, history tells us those who carry Mussolini jacket, Mussolini's jacket were not rewarded with anything. We despise people who have taken such a position. So, yeah, courage, boldness, and honesty is something 
that anyone who's living in the free societies can expect from our elected leaders. And finally, for consumers, uh, consumers have so much power. Um, I live, I have been living in the intersection of business law and human rights work, and I do know for a fact that uh, business executives pays very close attention to consumers' um, uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. Because when the consumers speak out, shareholders will hear first, and the shareholders can pressure mm -hmm. the business executives that could make, could be impactful. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll stop with one example. Last year, uh, during the uh, uh, opening, uh, uh, early last year, when the international uh, activist community was campaigning to boycott the Winter Olympics in Beijing, that some people called rightfully Genocide Olympics, there was a call not to watch the games. Mm -hmm. It was a very simple message. So as a result, because of that consumer activism, the NBC and CBC viewership dropped half, nearly 50%. That's wow. a huge money loss for those two networks. Mm -hmm. You have to buy broadcast rights by investing a lot of money in it. Mm -hmm. So NBC publicly acknowledged their viewership dropped nearly 50%. Mm -hmm. That kind of activism and can be reasonably expected from the consumers. It's as simple as putting back the cotton products uh, it says made in China or made in PRC. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you, Mr. Turkel, again for coming here to speak with us today and for sharing your insight, your knowledge, um, and also your personal um, experiences. I think it's been very interesting, very difficult to hear as well. Um, but uh, I think we've all we have a lot of food for thought. Um, Thank, you so to take home. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you so much. Thank you.